Uh, I'm Montana. I work at the machine learning platform at Instacart. Part of our mission is to build a firm foundation for all of our data scientists to create the most sophisticated models that they can possibly conceive uh, so that those deliver value back to our customers, our retailers, our shoppers, uh, and our CPG partners. The other big part of our mission is to empower our normal software engineers or data engineers to leverage machine learning in their organization uh, without necessarily having all of the expertise that our data scientists have when it comes to sophisticated modeling. So the way this plays out in practice um, is mostly what this talk will be about. I'll spend 10 minutes uh, in the beginning explaining high-level machine learning concepts for the data engineers in the room that may not be familiar. Before we go into any of that, I'll just tell you about, a little bit about Instacart so you understand why we care about data, why we care about data science, machine learning, and data engineering. Um, our core value prop is that we deliver groceries in as little as an hour uh, from the stores that you love. Uh, we connect customers to a personal shopper that deliver the service directly uh, to the customer in real time. We partner with local retailers to give the customers access to stores they're familiar with and also that they trust. We also offer coupons and other incentives from uh, CPGs, product manufacturers, for people not in the industry, uh, they can increase the value of our proposition back to the customer. The customer experience is, begins by them choosing a store. Uh, we partner with hundreds of retailers throughout the country to give them the largest selection possible. They'll select the groceries that they want from that retailer's warehouse. They'll build their shopping cart. They'll check out and choose a delivery time in as little as an hour. Um, and then we'll deliver those products to their door. From the shopper side of the equation, the shopper will get a notification that there's a delivery available to them. They will choose to accept that. They will go into the store. They will shop for all of the items. They will scan each item uh, so that they get strong verification signals. They can also replace items if it's out of stock. Eventually, they'll check out with an Instacart credit card at the retailer. Uh, and then they'll deliver those goods to the customer. One of the key ways we, we use machine learning at Instacart is on our search and discovery team. This is probably the most familiar part of the product to anybody who has used the service. Uh, we, we use supervised learning in several different examples. This is probably the most prominent form of machine learning in the industry right now that's currently delivering real value. Uh, the, when it comes to pure text matching on search results, it's often not going to be good enough when you have subtle differences like milk, milk, chocolate, or chocolate, milk that need vastly different search results. The way we improve this is to see what, what uh, features are in these products. We break every product down by its features. What, uh, what is the brand of the product? What is the fat content? Um, is it organic? Is it pasteurized, homogenized? How big is it? Where was it made? Uh, and we can go all the way down to the dominant color in the image uh, to see what exactly represents this product. Uh, we can encode all of this information numerically. Additionally, the fact that some of these products are missing information becomes important when it comes to ultimate search result quality. If something doesn't have an image, it's probably much less appealing to a customer. And so that kind of gap in the data uh, is actually a really big information signal when it comes to machine learning. It takes a lot of domain expertise to understand all of these features and their relevance to customers, which is why we embed all of our data scientists and machine learning engineers directly into small teams with product managers working closely together on a day-to-day -day basis. We don't have a centralized machine learning or data science or data eng team. Um, every product in our catalog shares a set of, am I on the right side? Oh, I think I got a slide behind, I'm sorry guys. Um, when we talk about an individual feature, uh, the key to successfully designing these features is translating our human understanding to numeric values. Uh, we call this encoding. For example, colors are continuous from red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, we can number those one through seven. Uh, software engineers have standardized on more than 16 million colors between red and violet. Uh, so a computer can tell you with much greater precision what color this milk is than I can. Uh, I would just call it cream. 
Every time a customer searches for milk and adds a product to their cart, they give Instacart dozens of training examples. They tell us the one product they added to their cart is milk, and all the other products we showed them are not a match for milk. Not everyone agrees on what the best match for milk is on Instacart, but this is where machine learning really shines. The features of each product are what's important, not any one example. The model will be trained to understand which features are statistically milky and which are not. Homogenized, pasteurized, grade A are all important for milk to have. Uh, keeping in mind that the model will also be trained with orange juice, which can be pasteurized, but it's often not homogenized. So machine learning models consider dozens of features holistically before they make a single decision. When we see new products uh, from new retailers at new stores, we can instantly serve great search results because our models have learned to generalize from individual features, not the products themselves. We can scale our catalog faster and more accurately than trying to hand label all of the products in the world. Once you move to a numeric model of the world, you unlock all sorts of functionality. I'll show you, I'll show you some of the ways we build on what our machines learn from search. One of the deep learning superpowers that we have is called transfer learning. Uh, we can use something learned in the previous model about what makes a good search result for milk, all of these products. Uh, we can transfer that to help with predictions on a new ta task. In this case, we want to find which products are competitive in our catalog so we can help our customers find them together, just like they do in brick and mortar stores. Coke and Pepsi are very similar numerically in a search for cola. Um, but it turns out very few people add both of them to the cart at the same time. That signal uh, that some products are similar or, or rarely purchased together allows us to merchandise them as competitive with each other. We can apply this same model the opposite direction uh, and we can say that when people buy peanut butter they often buy jelly and so we see the merchandising opportunity there as a complementary instead of competitive product. Um, that's a very quick look at what machine learning is and how it can be used to improve, say, a storefront. I want to talk to you about a product, project that's more top of mind for me right now, which is actually building the open source library that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We're using it now uh, throughout the org. Um, four out of four of our different data science teams are using it on all of their newest projects. We still have a large number of legacy models that are being deployed with various bespoke uh, techniques that we've developed over the last five years. But moving forward, we'd like to standardize how we develop and design models. So. And the, the really interesting thing here is that as we've taken our experience from building models by professionals who have had you know, dozens of years of industry experience combined from different organizations, we can boil those down into a set of best practices and what a typical model looks like, uh, what its life cycle is, uh, how we want to deploy those, how we want to maintain those, how we need to build those, that's going to work more or less generically and universally in this specialized supervised learning case. Um, so there is that caveat. This is a fairly complicated slide. We're going to break it down piece by piece and walk through it. And I'm going to put code up on the slideshow because that's the language I really like um, so that we can break it down into a step-by-step -step process of building and deploying a model into production at Instacart. Uh, Lore is the name of the project. It's available on PyPy as a pip package. You can pip install it. That's always the first step. Uh, it's, it's similar in its command line conventions to Rails. Instacart is a Rails shop. So if you've ever uh, done web development, you can call Rails new. You'll generate this big framework dump of a directory inside your, um, your GitHub repo. And, and so a lot, of, a lot of the thinking of uh, convention over configuration, of simplicity, of ease of use, of being opinionated about certain things that there are a hundred different options and most of them are good, most of them have trade-offs. We saw earlier benchmarks between Snowflake, Redshift, um, and BigQuery. Does it really matter? Maybe, but ease of use is what we want to solve for most of the time. We want to solve for developer productivity. Uh, yeah. So the, the way you create a new machine learning project 
at Instacart, which may be used for a single model, but oftentimes they're, they're used for a whole family of models, like we just saw in the search example. When you have one model very quickly, you'll start to find all of these other applications where you want very similar combinations of features, slightly different objective functions uh, as a result. And so keeping all of that code together in the same project really enables us to reuse and create more modular, testable uh, systems. The first command here, like I said, was you install the lore package that will give you a command line application. You can lore init a new project, uh, and that will give you a directory with a base skeleton that's deployable on Heroku. Uh, you can use a Heroku build pack to deploy these things into production. You can wrap them up in a Docker file if you want. And basically all that means is you'll get an empty Flask app running nothing because we haven't actually created a model yet. The third command here at the dollar sign is to generate a scaffold. Um, and what we're gonna try to predict is when a delivery is created, uh, three or four months later, occasionally, you know, we'll have somebody call us up and say, hey, I never did that. Um, and they'll, they'll issue a credit card dispute on their credit card. So this is a very costly thing when it happens to Instacart, even though it's an incredibly rare event, uh, which makes it a very difficult machine learning problem. It's a very important problem to solve is to know if, is this delivery a legitimate delivery? Is, are the features that we have, the signals that we have, at the time the customer checks out before we've paid you know, for $200 in groceries and spent an hour driving it over to their house, is this the person's credit card? Uh, do we actually have a legitimate transaction taking place here? Uh, and I think you'll see machine learning deployed pretty broadly across all types of fraud detection in the industry. So what, what we're, we're doing here is adding a, a regression uh, parameter to the scaffold. So we're gonna generate a regression um, model. If you, if you wanna think about supervised learning models, there are broadly two types. There are classification, where you're trying to predict is it A, B, or C? And then there's regression, where you're predicting a continuous value, a numeric value, so zero to infinity, or negative infinity to positive infinity. A lot of people will bound it from zero to one. So regression is predicting a continuous range of numbers, categor uh, categorical or binary categorization or multiple classification. These have specific discrete buckets that you're trying to predict things in. We could frame this problem as a binary classification, true or false. We can frame it as a regression prob uh, probabilistic problem of from zero to one, how likely is it to be fraud? So zero being there's no chance, one being there's a 100% chance of it being fraud. The data scientist will have opinions about which of these is the appropriate technique, true or false. Your product manager will have uh, opinions about do they want a true or false or do they want a sliding scale of zero to 100. So this is actually a very important design decision on what you're going to do with your machine learning model. It's why it's, it's escalated all the way to the command line parameter. There's a lot more command line parameters you can add if you want. Um, you don't have to generate the full scaffold if you don't want, if you just want to generate any single one of these things. We'll go ahead and talk about what all of the types of things that are being generated are. Uh, for now, I'm going to gloss over the six files that come out. Other than to point out there's some tests, there's some IPython notebooks, which anybody who's done data science should be familiar with, and then there's three uh, Python classes that are generated. Uh, we'll start with the, the data source. Uh, and create an extract. Everybody who's in data engineering is familiar with ETL processes. This is strictly an extract. It typically looks like a SQL file. In our case, we're only going to have one feature in the very first version of our model for, to keep this short so that we can all make it a happy hour. Um, in this case, we're gonna look at the visitor's IP address. Uh, what is the latitude and the longitude that they had the delivery delivered to? And then we have the, the truth, the training of was this credit card charge actually disputed within some time frame. So we can actually measure the distance between the, we can geolocate the IP address and then we can measure the distance between that IP address and where the delivery address is and see is this person actually at the place that they're having it delivered from? Are they in you know, Russia? or just testing fake credit card numbers to see if they can find some new way to scam us. That's a, it's a pretty quick query. 
but you'll notice that it's actually going to return every delivery from all time. We'll run, run this against our data warehouse, Redshift, something that actually, actually handle that kind of load. And then we'll, we're basically pulling that entire table into memory for these four columns. The, the next step in the pipeline will be to run that data into a cache and then to split it apart. Uh, it's very important when you do machine learning that you, you want your training data, but you also want two other sets of data split out of that. You want your validation data, which you'll use pretty soon, and then you want your test data. The reason you split those out is because you don't want your algorithm to get to peek at the answers that you're going to test it against. You're going to show it a bunch of data, let it train on that, while you've held out some data for later. And then after it thinks it knows the right answers, you use that data to test it again. And we'll actually have two different te test phases in many of our machine learning models. One is an iterative test that you go through continuously, uh, and you tr constantly try and optimize your machine learning against that data set. If you do that, though, you're running the risk that you're optimizing the data set just for that little thing. So after you're all done, once you finally put your stamp of approval, said I'm happy with the results that I'm getting, then you get to actually use your final test set. Um, and that's your final score that you would use to say whether you have improved upon the previous efforts. Um, so going, going forward, we'll, we'll actually construct our pipeline. Uh, this pipeline is probably not like most of your data eng pipelines. This was sort of an overloaded term that we use in machine learning. This pipeline inherits from the base uh, lore pipeline class. Um, this is a holdout pipeline, so it's going to hold out those two extra slices of the data set. And it has basically one job, which is to return a data frame in the get data method. This is, lore is an object-oriented language, so you typically will inherit from a base class and then you'll override one or two key uh, methods, or the whole thing if you really want to get crazy. Uh, so you can see here that we're lore IO Redshift is our pooled Redshift connection that has appropriate credentials. This is configured for the project in a configuration file. This is all available. We have very many connections in lore IO. We have S3 access. We have uh, Postgres access, we have Redis access, we have all of these things that our wonderful data engineers provide to us pre-configured for our software engineers and our machine learning engineers to access with a single function call. Data frame returns a pandas data frame. If you're familiar with Python, it's basically an in-memory table. You can perform many of the SQL-like operations we're used to in a highly efficient manner. Um, uh, an interesting caveat it is, is that it's columnar, similar to our data warehouses. It's not row oriented, so your operations should be, um, you should just keep that in mind when you're working with it. The, the final thing to keep in mind is that we're using the SQL file here that we pre created previously, and we're gonna cache that. Uh, you don't have to cache if you don't want to, but uh, I like caching. And the next step is to actually take all of the raw data that we had, uh, and we had an IP address and two different, a lat, a longe, and then the final answer. And what we actually wanted to calculate was the distance between that IP address and the lat and the longe. So this is a bit of a contrived example. But these are encoders inside of lore. Back inside of our pipeline, we're going to uh, define a second function that returns the encoders that are appropriate that we actually want to use to construct the features for our machine learning model. So in this case, what we've said is that we want to calculate the distance between these two, uh, the latitude and the longitude, and then we're going to use the GIP, GOIP transformer on the IP address to get this latitude, another transformer on the IP address to get the longitude. All of those will be in, uh, input to the distance transformer. Uh, Norm is the actual encoder. The difference between encoders and transformers is that encoders are stateful. Transformers are not. Transformers are pure functions, so they don't need any memory. They don't need to have ever seen anything, any data like this data to know. The, on the other hand, machine learning models, particularly deep learning models, they don't like very large numbers. Uh, if you pass it 10,000 in one feature and your other feature only is between zero and one, the zero to 10,000 feature can completely dominate and swamp the other feature. So what norm does is it looks at all of the values in that feature and it divides it by the average and the standard deviation, I'm sorry, subtracts the average and divides by the standard deviation so that you get a, a small number around 
um, zero to one for, for most of your inputs, which is, is nice for most machine learning. So, but of course that's stateful and it's dependent on that particular model. So this is something that we have to keep track of for all time now, because during the training data we learned what the average and the standard deviation of this was. And so we have to now save that with the model. Uh, and keep that going forward so that any new data that we see later on, we can apply the same transformations and encoding to it. For the, the final bit, we're going to get the output. The output is this disputed column that we want to predict whether this delivery will be eventually a credit card dispute. We're going to use the pass encoder on it, which simply says, take the value I'm giving you. Um, it's basically a no-op because we like the fact that this is already a Boolean from the database. It's already zero to one. Once we've got that, uh, that's basically the end of our pipeline. Uh, Lore will take care of doing pretty much all of the rest. To finish our model, we need to inherit from the base class that we choose. In this class, we're going to use the Keras library, which is built on TensorFlow. It's a deep learning library. Uh, you need to implement the constructor, which basically passes a pipeline and an estimator. Um, you don't actually need a subclass because all we're doing is we're creating an instance of the superclass with these two parameters. So you could just instantiate the superclass and assign the pipeline and assign the estimator that we want to use. The estimator that we're using is a default lore estimator. Um, so we're going to actually swap out the binary classifier. Um, this is because halfway through my talk slides, I decided I'd rather use binary classification for this problem uh, because my product manager made a last second change um, rather than the regression that I started with. So it's very important and it's very cool that I can start with one type of model. I can make a one line change here after I've generated my scaffold and I'm not boxed into a corner. Um, or if I'm actually doing the testing like I should as a good data scientist, then I'll actually be able to compare, well, what does it look like if I'm doing binary classification? How many trues and falses do I get? Versus if I do a linear regression, uh, how are we going to actually choose the data point that decides what action we take? You know, maybe if it's very likely, then we completely block it. If it's semi-likely, we send it to review. If it's moderately likely, uh, we just throw up an error on the website. This is our product manager questions. Um, so that, that basically gets us our full model. That is a machine learning model. You have all this now. Uh, you can then go back to your command line. You can run lore test. You can make sure you didn't make any typos. Uh, this will build the model. It will run the SQL against your test database that you've already set up. Uh, make sure that your SQL actually executes, returns rows. It will take those rows. It will feed it all. It's generally very quick. Uh, as long as your test database is very quick. Hopefully you don't have 8 billion rows in your test database locally on your laptop. But uh, if you did, that would be a pretty exhaustive test. Those are t automatic smoke tests generated by the framework when you generate your model. You can, of course, write as many unit tests as you want when you're thinking about what could break in my data, which is, which is actually a very important practice. The, the next step of, okay, great, we've got a piece of software, it's on my laptop, that's fantastic. Uh, I want to deploy this code to a central server, uh, which Instacart uses a mono repo. All of our code is in the same GitHub repository for the entire organization. All of our projects were just in subfolders, which is really interesting in practice. Um, it works surprisingly well because I can grep the code base for any string and I can see who's using any column in the database or any other features that I'm interested in. Um, in this case, I can check my code in. Uh, that creates an automatic deploy. It'll go out to a staging server. I can SSH into that staging server. In that case, it has the real Redshift connection. Um, it has everything that it needs to be running against production data. I've already tested it locally, so I'm not afraid of it breaking. I can then call lore fit, which is another command. Um, then I pass it the name of the model that we just created, which is this loss prevention to predict delivery disputes. It'll go ahead and fire up. It'll start training on as many samples as it has. This is running against my local laptop database with 100 samples. Uh, it's going to validate on 10 sec samples. Uh, 10 samples are invisible here, which are being held out for later testing. You, you can. TensorFlow is really cool because it gives you this ETA on how long each epoch is going to take. You can see this is the loss 
the loss is basically the difference between the predictions it's making and the true answers it's getting to see during training. So you want this number to go down over time as you let this thing run for some number of epochs. Each pass through the full data is considered an epoch. You'll, you'll see that the loss will go down from its initial value that's very high, say 1.5. It'll get down to 0.55, 0.53, 0.52. With each, each epoch, it'll almost always continue to go down. Because over time, the model will start to memorize more and more of the data because it's seeing this data multiple times. So it can start eventually. It can just memorize the whole thing. And then you'll get zero loss. You'll get perfect predictions. But the important part of the validation is that it has to then go and make predictions against data that it's never been trained on before. So it's got this second set of data and it starts making predictions over here. And this is what we're actually looking at. This is what we're actually considering. This will very rarely be better than this. Um, and you'll see this number will come down over time. But eventually, this number will start going up as your model starts wasting more and more resources on memorization that don't generalize to things that it's never seen before. And as soon as that starts going up, patience is a parameter you can pass during training. But you, so you can wait maybe five times or zero times, however many you want. As soon as that starts going up, you want to stop training your model because it's wasting time. Once, that, once you call that, that model is then saved to the model store. The model store is configurable. Again, this can be an S3 bucket. It can be your local hard drive. It can be Redis, if that's where you like to store binary data. Um, uh, some important files that are generated during this whole process. Uh, you have your requirements TXT and your runtime TXT. Runtime is your Python version. So that's just going to have 3.6.4 or, or 2.7. Lore is compatible with either, because we have many old data science projects that nobody wants to port from 2.7 to 3.6. But uh, we're doing everything in 3.6 now. Um, requirements TXT will be a completely frozen set of all requirements that the model was built with, uh, all the way down to the minimum version of the most dependent package, so that you don't have to worry about if somebody else checks out your project, will they be able to run your model because you know Flask has upgraded some minor dependency that's no longer compatible and they don't know which version of Flask you were using. Um, so this, this actually solves a huge class of problems. It's definitely a best practice for us. Uh, you've got your database configuration, which you can use environment variables to interpolate depending on the system that you're running in, which connections should be available. Inside of there, it's your typical Python config file. So that's the any format. Um, which just specifies string name equals connection parameters. Or you can go the more verbose route of string name, and then you can say host, port, IP, user, password, whatever. Um, there's also a AWS config files there, which will take your IM role, things like that, if you use AWS services, um, which we rely on pretty heavily at Instacart. You'll notice that when we cached, uh, the, the original get data response um, it actually creates this file on disk, which it uses hashing on the SQL file to generate a unique key at that point in time for what the SQL is. Uh, it dumps all of that into a pickle so that if you then call that back from the disk cache, you'll, you'll get a near instantaneous result. Um, pickle is actually, surprisingly, one of the fastest uh, Python serialization. I mean, it's not that surprising since it's the native Python serialization. But you know, you see all these benchmarks for HDF5 and things like that. These much more uh, uh, niche, uh, configurable serialization formats. Pickle, the, I should caveat in 3.6 with the latest pickling version, uh, is actually incredibly fast. It's basically doing an M map direct to disk and then back out again. Um, what you'll you'll see is that when we trained our model, when we called fit, that generates a fitting number of one. Every time you call fit, you will get a new, new model serialized to disk uh, that will represent that fitting. So you'll have a bunch of uh, monotonically incrementing numbers here. You'll have a bunch of results files that are generated. Um, because this is a deep learning model, it actually has weights, uh, which are in that wonderful uh, HDF5 format that I love so much. Um, and you've also got the pickle, which will have everything from your encoders and other various bits about the model. What we're, we save a bunch of statistics about the test results and the parameters and the loss and how the uh, model was trained over history so that we can graph those later and visualize uh, a bunch of characteristics. And of course, we have logging. Logging is near and dear to my heart. Uh, it solves a lot of debugging problems. It's amazing to me how many data scientists 
don't, don't really take the time to set up great logging for everything that's coming into their system and going out of their system. Uh, in development, of course, this goes to your local host. In production, this goes to our logging provider. Um, and then we have all of this greffable, searchable stuff. Uh, the, the cool thing is that the logging that we get from training is configured exactly the same way as the logging that we have running at inference time. So that we can, we can watch our training logs come in, we can watch our inference logs come in. Um, speaking of inference, that's the next slide. Uh, so this is great. We've, we've got a model and we've saved it to our hard drive or to S3 or somewhere. Uh, the, whole, the whole point of having a model is having a service that runs in production that the rest of your application can call and make predictions um, so that when an order is created, we can make a, an API call to this model, we can predict whether it's going to be fraudulent or not, and we can uh, take some action in the application at runtime in real time. Some models don't have real time requirements, some models have you know, batched nightly. Um, so the only thing they will do is they will call fit every night and then they'll call predict on the whole database every night and they'll dump all of the predictions to the database and that's it. Um, so that, that's great. You use Redshift or you use Snowflake. We're using both uh, in production now. Um, <laughs> you know, why not? Um, <laughs> Um, so the, we need to add a few more components to this model so that we can do inference in real time. Uh, specifically, we can go back to our extract. This is a newer feature that we're, we're playing with, which is Jinja2 templates in our SQL. What we want to do at inference is we want to scope this query to a specific delivery. We don't want to pull the whole database. We don't want to connect to Redshift, which will take minutes. Uh, we just want to pull the most recent up-to-date data from Postgres. Uh, and since Redshift and Postgres are, have, and Snowflake all have very similar dialects, this works surprisingly well in practice. Um, we create our template from Jinja2 that has this extra predicate on the end. We'll take our original get data from our pipeline. We'll expand that so that it, now it takes a delivery ID parameter. And if there's an extra delivery ID, we'll need to pass it to the template. Uh, we'll also want to use Postgres as our data store of choice. Um, because now we're just pulling back a single row, um, whereas previously we were pulling back a lot of data from Redshift. So this, this, if you pass a delivery ID to this get data function, we expect millisecond response time. If you don't pass a delivery ID to this function, we expect uh, it's like 30 minutes runtime for the Redshift query to return enough data. Um, you can. This is just a little temporary variable to hold the the template interpolation. Uh, and then we'll just pass that to the connection, which in, is either Redshift, Postgres, and it's the same data frame call. And this time we're going to pass it raw SQL instead of a file name. There are lots more options you can pass here. And you can always directly pass interpolation variables to SQL, which get interpolated safely, whether they're strings or numbers. Um, we need to make one final uh, modification to our model. It has this predict method, which is provided by default, but now we want to predict based on a delivery ID. We don't want to predict based on the default, which is a full data frame. Typically, we'll pass in the full data frame of all of the data. So our model at inference time might not even have a database connection. We'll just provide it with all of the data over the wire. It'll take that data in as a data frame. It'll run it through the estimator uh, as a prediction. In this case, we're going to use the pipeline to get the same data from the um, just for that delivery ID from the database. And it's going to be using an identical query, uh, which is, ensures that we don't have feature mismatch between training and prediction time. So that's, that's a really hard problem to solve. Sometimes you can't always do this. Sometimes it's just not feasible. You need fact tables in one that you don't have in the other. Um, but when you can do this, it it's, follows the keep it simple, stupid principle. Um, pretty well. So once, once you've done that, you've added your delivery ID parameter. At runtime, you can fire up a lore server, uh, which is just a little flask app. It will, it will automatically generate endpoints for all of your models. You can call predict on them. You can pass them whatever parameters you like, and it'll give you an answer. Uh, at this point, you've, you're pretty much ready to go into production with your model. Uh, this is a pretty tight experimentation loop. Once I've got something like this running, I can go add, you know, I think our, our model is up to 160 features in production now to detect fraud. 
but without a system like this that I can continuously rerun my query, continuously evaluate the performance, launch new instances into, into a test and training, um, it takes a lot longer to iterate if I'm, if I'm waiting. Uh, make one SQL change, wait two days. Uh, that didn't work. One more SQL change, wait two days. So having sort of continuous deployment, continuous integration, uh, cloud scalability and deployment for multiple branches into different scenarios before I actually choose one to commit to master to push and deploy has greatly accelerated our, our development time for machine learning models at Instacart. Um, this is basically the, the finalized picture of everything. I think I've covered most of the most of the boxes there. Um, just to go over a few of the transformers that we've built in-house that we find we use a lot. Uh, the GeoIP is cool. It uses MaxMind's database. You can get all kinds of geographic data about anybody who's visiting your site. You can calculate distance like we went over. Date, time, and string manipulations are critical. We use these all the time to generate features from whatever happened to be stored in the database. We can generate more um, interesting transformers, like I want to extract the domain from an email. Um, you can have a fairly complicated or simple regex to do that. I think the official one is three pages long or something. Uh, extracting the area code from a phone number. These are all fun things that make good features in machine learning models, but if you don't have them easily accessible, it's kind of a pain to extract the area code from a free text phone number that may be internationalized, it may have parentheses, it may not. And so a lot of the time, you know, data scientists will skip these kinds of you know, minor feature engineering improvements, um, which is unfortunate. So we, we like having a big library. Uh, we use US Census data that we can statistically predict the age or sex or um, whether you're, like a name like mom, in a phone book is a pretty good indication that you're closely related to that person. So there, there's just a ton of information out there that when we have a, a full library, we can do much more advanced feature engineering much more cheaply. Encoders are the key building block that I told you about. They're stateful representations that we use to do uh, feature engineering. Uh, I heard somebody ask earlier about one-hot encoding. That's interesting because for some machine learning algorithms, you have to use one-hot encoding when you're dealing with categorical variables. For others, like Keras, they have um, a built-in ability to handle that in a much more performant way on the GPU. So we have a unique encoder that will take as many categoricals as you need. And depending on whether you're using a Keras estimator or an XGBoost estimator or a scikit-learn, what your machine learning model actually needs, if it needs it to be one hot encoded and expanded into that sparse format, it'll do that. If it doesn't, then you saved a lot of computation. Um, things like the glove encoder, uh, I don't know if you know about the glove word embeddings, but these are the ones where if you have a word like king and you subtract the word man and you add the word woman, then you end up with the word queen. Um, so these are more cool feature engineering that you can do. Uh, so we can actually transform all of the words in your input into their glove embeddings, um, which can be really useful when you're dealing with things like product names and et cetera. Uh, we, we support everything in scikit-learn, XGBoost, and Keras and TensorFlow right now. We're open to adding more libraries, but this is, these are the primary toolkits that our data scientists and machine learning uh, engineers use at Instacart. So that, that's pretty much it um, for, for me. Thank you guys very much. Questions? <laughs> Any questions for Matana? Uh, thanks, that was really cool. Um, do you guys do anything around handling horizontal scaling once you deploy to production? And how about like A-B testing of your models to make sure that your new models don't perform worse than your old models? So one of the things I didn't cover is that every model has a predict, it has an evaluate, and it has a score function. The score function is something that you're expected to override. Um, and if your score is lower than the previous training run, um, you will not be auto-deployed to production. So there's, there are things like that. Typically, right now, when, when a data scientist is doing hyperparameter search, this is another thing that we support. Uh, it's not fully parallelized yet. Uh, this is on our roadmap so that you can, you know, you want to test n hyperparameters, you'll fire up 50 boxes, we'll go run all of those 50 concurrently, collect the results back, um, but that's not ready yet. 
We, we do have uh, support for multi-GPU in, uh, in Keras, which is available, um, which can, it's, it's difficult to say that that always provides linear speed up with GPUs. I think that the truth is it depends on the exact characteristics of your data set and your model. But there are two different strategies that we support. You can toggle them with flags and see. Uh, software engineering skewed workflow. You know, it was clearly designed by someone who knows Ruby on Rails, so scaffolding and unit testing built in, et cetera. I was wondering how that ends up interacting with the data scientists in your organization, who, in my experience, often are more resistant to frameworks like that and want to lurk in integrated environments like RStudio or you know, Jupyter Notebooks and whatnot. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. So Jupyter Notebooks are a big part of our data science workflows. Uh, those are fully supported in Lore. A big part of it is that as soon as you type Lore install, it will pull down all the packages. It will build you a virtual env in Python. Uh, it will install that in your Jupyter Notebook. You can fire up your notebook and have your data science workflow that you want to have. Uh, at the end of the day, you're expected to take the results of your Jupyter Notebook, uh, copy and paste those into these cells. Um, once you finalize that. And this is something that we've worked with a lot on our data science. I'm a software engineer at heart, uh, going back many more years. Um, but I think that uh, as long as we, we let them open up the black box and we give them these windows that they can completely replace an estimator with a completely custom TensorFlow or PyTorch uh, implementation. I guess that's the hot one now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I got a feature request last week. Uh, so that's cool, uh, and we're, we're happy to do that. It's pretty easy, it's pretty seamless. All of this ends up in a very standardized way as long as you conform to a few key milestones, which data scientists have been like, fine, I'll do that for you. <laughs> yeah. Quick question. Um, kind of a follow up to the last question. Um, so the encoder's idea is really cool. Do you have any? Um, kind of tools or tricks to speed up the extract part or like to encode that? So I am probably the weakest data engineer in this room. Um, I, I write my Redshift query and I expect that it works. We, we have an amazing data engineering team who could probably give you these tips and tricks of use a dist key or make sure you have your sort key right. Um, but for the most part, we, we write a lot of SQL. Uh, we tune it by hand, we test it against our systems. We have experts in-house that because we are in a monolithic repository, uh, every, every SQL statement that gets issued against a database is tagged with the uh, code line number that it's coming from. And so our database monitors will then flag high CPU usage queries. Uh, and then you'll, you'll work with an expert in that system on what are you actually trying to do and how can we do this better? Sometimes the, the answer is like, well, you have to do a whole bunch more engineering, you have to put this in Redis, you have to pre-calculate features. Uh, that's hard, that takes a lot of work. We try not to do that. We try to do the simplest thing that can work, which is have really, really large Redis or Snowflake um, deployments. Uh, how do you use, how do you ensure that the data that you use for uh, training from Redshift and the data that you use during scoring from Postgres uh, are identical? And two, uh, how do you, do you ensure that the feature encoders that you use for training and the feature encoders that you use for scoring are also exactly the same, given that you use two different languages, one with Python for training and probably Ruby for scoring? No, so all of the scoring happens, uh, so I'll answer your second question first. All the scoring happens in Python using the same encoders. It's all, it's all one thing. It's pickled, it's unpickled, it never changes. Um, and, and so that's why the, the Flask server gives us an HTTP API. We actually have our own RPC service that we use that goes over RabbitMQ internally. Um, but Flask is so that we can make this a nice external open source project. Your first question, can you say that one more time? Okay, so what happens typically is our Postgres database is replicated to many read replicas, which is sort of our first line of attack. Uh, that then gets replicated directly to Redshift or Snowflake. Um, and so we, we try to use identical tables that have had one-to-one -one replication. Uh, that's dangerous because 
what you may have historically in Redshift. Uh, so if, uh, if something gets updated after the fact, like let's say that we nullify the visit IP address whenever there's fraud. Um, the model will now look at all these fraud, they'll see null IP address, they're like, oh, this is so easy, right? Um, but then at prediction time. So that's something that you, you just have to be careful about. You have to do the data science diligence. And typically, it's really obvious when somebody comes to you like, I can detect 99.99% of fraud. Um, it's like, well, maybe we should you know, verify this a little bit more before we roll it out in production. Everything we roll out gets A-B tested. That's the ultimate answer. Um, of checking the quality of something. If it, it doesn't matter how good your loss looks uh, in any graph if you're not actually impacting business metrics. So at the end of the day, we can roll it out in an A-B test and see, see if it works. And we, we typically do A-B testing. Um, we have blog posts. It's very hard uh, to A-B test logistical businesses that involve large integer programming problems where you have to come up with a universal <laughs> optimal solution. You can't solve half of the universe at once. Um, so that's interesting, but uh, that's, we, we generally scale up our A-B tests from 1% you know, exposure to 10% over time and roll out that way. All right. Oh, more questions. Uh, so cool system. Um, I'm curious about the speed. So like, how what's what's the fastest you can kind of deliver predictions in with? Because you're serializing pipelines in. Do they get deserialized and kind of stick in memory? Or, or? yeah. So the the timers and the loggers uh, were actually the biggest bottleneck on speed until we measured our timers with more timers. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I have a 300 line query that I run against our Postgres read replica. It takes about 22 milliseconds to aggregate all of the data for a single fraud query. Um, that's the average. If a user has a long history, it can take up to a second. Um, we're lucky because we can implement a timeout there because if users have long history, they're much less likely to be committing fraud. Uh, so there are some cheats that you can, you can play with. Uh, I think that uh, if you're talking about Deep learning inference can be super fast. You're, again, you're talking about milliseconds. Uh, 50 milliseconds, I think, is the prediction speed of a model that has about 10 million parameters um, for this particular problem. Uh, and that's actually an ensemble with XGBoost, which has uh, a few hundred trees. So, so I, all in all, this is, these are well below the one, one second cutoff that we typically reserve for RPC calls out during a customer transaction. Our, our, our PC setup? Um, I, it's not common. I think that one day we would like to open source it. Uh, it's a Ruby and Python RPC service that works over RabbitMQ. Um, so it does both pub sub and it does both direct calls. So you enqueue your call into Rabbit, and you can either have listeners that listen for that published event, or you can have uh, consumers that will consume that event and then post a reply back onto Rabbit, and then it will be reverse consumed for a RPC call. So it, it's a nice universal 